I'm John McNellis with McNellis Partners. A little bit about our firm to start. Uh, we've been in the retail development business, uh, that is neighborhood shopping centers, what uh, used to be called barbell shopping centers, supermarket on one end, shops in the middle, drugstore on the other. Uh, we started that about 35 years ago. Uh, we had no money and no experience, and now we've got a little bit of one in a lifetime of another. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about a very specific part of the development business, that is partners. If you want to get a broader view of starting, running, and hopefully succeeding with a small development business, you might take a look at this talk I gave a few years ago for the ULI. It's on YouTube. And there were a couple of follow-on talks, one on buying property right, the other on uh, what I think is real estate's hardest decision, what's that uh, sell versus hold when you have a, a truly wonderful asset. It's all in the book. Uh, the ULI kindly published this book, Making It in Real Estate. I think it's available here for purchase. If not, I, you can pick it up for 10 bucks on Amazon. Uh, the reviews have been unfailingly kind. I, I didn't have to pay Preston Butcher all that much you know, for this review. <laughs> anyway. All right, we're gonna talk about partners. It, you can divide the world, you know, it, so many people do uh, in so many different contexts into, into two. You can divide uh, partners, I think, for uh, developers into two. That is operating partners on the one hand, financial on the other. Operating partners are a much easier proposition to deal with, so let's talk about them first. I suggest if, if you're starting out, and some of you may be, and some of you have been with me here at ULI forever, but if you're starting out, I suggest you do your very first deal all on your own. Uh, you buy it, you finance it, you, you paint it, you put in the petunias, you manage it, you do the accounting. What this does for you is it enables you to get a pretty good sense of what your service providers do. Uh, and you know, if you stumble through it yourself, you'll have a greater appreciation for them. However, you do that once or maybe twice, and then if you have any ambition at all, I think you've got to get away from that. Time does leverage better than money. The moment you can afford to have somebody else get your loans, paint your houses, do your accounting, you need to do that. You, what you need to be able to do as a young developer is leverage your time. You need to focus on your most valuable personal skill. And if you were meant to be a developer, what is that skill? That's obvious. It's finding, sourcing, and closing deals. So the moment you can do it, you move on to outside help. Now, if you start out in the, the, at the bottom of, of the, the mountain peak, in the financial valley, if you start out at that bottom and you, you want to work your way to the financial peak, I'm going to suggest that you consider a base camp of consultants. That is, you rent, you hire consultants by the hour as long as you can, as opposed to hiring full-time employees or certainly partners. Why? Well, think about it. If you're doing reasonably well and you're spending 100,000 a year on your, your lawyer, and she's earning 200,000 a year in her law firm, unless you have a Napoleon complex, you'd be crazy to hire her for twice as much money. Less intuitively though, let's say you've moved on and you've got 300,000 a year in, in legal fees, and you could hire her for 200,000. Even then, because of the great advantage of consultants, the great advantage is that you can cap them any given day. Your deal blows up, you let that consultant go that same day. I suggest to you that even the flintiest, hardest hearted developer very seldom fires uh, or lets go his employees on the very first day that he should, you know, on the day the deal blows up. So rent. But there will come a time if you're being successful, when you need to move beyond consultants. And the question is, how do I do it? Do I go with employees or partners? And this isn't as an obvious a choice as one might think. Employees, if you think about it, they're going to be a lot more expensive if you fail, but no one's planning on failing, of course or they'll be more expensive if you're just sort of middlingly successful. If on the other hand, uh, it's World Series today, let's stick with a baseball metaphor. If you, on your deal, you hit it 400 feet, 
deep center field in Chavez Ravine, and you've got partners, and you think you could have done that uh, without the partners, those partners will have proven inordinately expensive. So it's, it's a tough call. The thing I'll point out that you don't necessarily get better help through partners than employees. Key employees can be every bit as effective and efficient. And oh, by the way, you know, I've given this, this talk a little bit. I have found that the best way for me to impart information is to do it in a question and answer period. I, I know we're filming here, but please, if you have a question or a comment, uh, please feel free to interrupt. I, I may not be able to see you, so you should probably shout out. Anyway, you don't necessarily get a better economic deal with partners, but there's more to life than money. Uh, properly viewed, I think life's about the journey rather than how much is in your suitcase at the last stop. So what did we do? I've had my same two partners for 35 years, Mike Powers and Beth Walter. If it weren't for them, I think I'd be a night manager at some motel. Uh, it's, it's been absolutely great. I think with partners, you share the losses, you share the joy, you, you shoulder the work together. It's just more fun. And I will tell you that anecdotally and what I can observe from my ULI colleagues, a lot of them have done the same thing. They have career-long partners. All right, financial partners. A, a little bit more interesting case. Financial partners, we all start with them. If you're born rich, your first financial partner is your family. If you're like the rest of us, it's your friends. But you have to start with one by necessity. The question is, do you stick with financial partners once you no longer need to? Benefits of long-term financial partners are so obvious they scarcely need to be commented on. And I will say that I think the majority of the biggest, best developers in the country have long-term financial partners. Deal flow. So obvious, uh, what can I tell you? You can do more, bigger, better deals. Prestige, particularly for your outside friends, you know, your, your friends as you see at the gym, when you say, I'm working on this $300 million project and I'm a partner, much more impressive than saying, you know, I'm trying to rehab this corner coffee shop. I think the, one of the biggest things that isn't um, stressed enough, and I do want to stress it on behalf of financial partners, is the risk management. Typical deal, and I think most of you know it, is the financial partner puts almost all the money up. Used to be 100%, now it might be closer to 90%, and the developer puts up 10. The partnership, the limited partnership agreement, or general partnership agreement, is non-recourse. That is, and there's a catch to this, and someone asked me about this later in the Q&A. You have no financial personal liability to the financial partner, nor does she back to you the other way. So you can leverage your time. You can get into a very large deal for a relatively small amount of money. If I walk you through an example, it, it'll be a little bit more obvious. Let's say you have a $10 million project. It doesn't matter what, office building, hotel. Uh, financially, they're kind of fungible. $4 million in equity, $6 million in debt. The developer puts up 10%. That's $400,000, or 4% 4 of the total cost. The financial partner puts up 90%. Because you have a big financial partner, you're not going to guarantee the loan. What you'll probably guarantee is simply the completion of construction. So as long as you can complete construction, you have no risk. And it's probably not even 4% that your risk, but it's closer to 2 because every developer who's risen to the level of doing $10 million deals knows that she can charge, in addition to her share of the profits, uh, a two or three percent of hard costs and maybe a small acquisition fee. So maybe the total investment uh, by the developer is at two percent, which means if the project collapses, and you know, and let's face it, folks, sometimes they do, uh, you're only risking a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, if the project goes well, and let's just walk through one, I think th three million dollar profit on a ten million dollar deal, that, that's a, uh, somewhere between a double and a triple, I guess, that'd be a good deal. The developer could net on that couple hundred thousand dollar investment close to a million two. Uh, that's, that's a great deal for a limited risk. Whoops. Let's go back a stage. And so now, it, quickly enough, we've kind of arrived at, at the heart of the presentation today. 
and that is you had to have that financial partner for the first five or six deals you did. You, you started out with nothing, but th you've been doing well, you've been selling these, you now have $4 million that you can invest. The question is, do you do your own deal? You take that, that $10 million deal and do it yourself, no partners, you put your whole $4 million in, you put your net worth in that deal, or you take that $4 million and seed 10 new uh, financial partner JV deals at $400,000 a piece. $10 million deal without a financial partner. You put in $4 million, it goes well. You're going to net more than $3 million. Why? Because you're not going to charge yourself any fees. Uh, that would just be creating ordinary income out of capital gains. Wrong way to go. And uh, you're not going to be paying a preferred return on your own money. So maybe you'd net $3.5 million. On the other hand, you do the, take that 10 excuse me, that four million invested in 10 deals, and you could make almost $12 million. So there's the comparison. If you do it on your own, maybe you've got three and a half million, and if you do it with a financial partner, you're talking about $12 million. At first, this seems like such a no-brainer, it's such a simple conclusion. It reminds me, since you know, I could see the Hollywood sign from my hotel room, it, it reminds me of the uh, the joke about the Hollywood producer who went crazy and invested his own money in the movie. You know, it's like, why would you ever do that? Um, but it may not be so simple. First of all, I, there's a couple of assumptions that I think you really need to challenge. The first one is, I think everybody in this room will agree that it is very hard to find a single great deal. Uh, they're just few and far between. To find 10 in a row, uh, I think is virtually impossible. So it's not very likely that you're going to average um, $3 million in profit over 10 deals. The other, perhaps a little bit counterintuitively, you, you, everybody in business grows up to learn, to hear that uh, diversifying is, is the way to go. Diversifying into 10 deals may not be as uh, uh, risk-free, or it may actually even be more risky than doing a single great deal. I have found that when people have to push deal quotas, they have to loosen their due diligence requirements and their underwriting requirements. Pushing deals could actually intensify your risk. And then finally the point, if you're meant to be a developer, you can do a $10 million deal all on your own. Uh, and maybe you can do two of them all on your own or possibly three. But at some point, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of community meetings, there's a lot, just a lot of detail. You're gonna be back to my earlier point, you're gonna be taking on partners or employees. So your overhead is going to skyrocket and your profit share is going to go down. So it's probably not a fair comparison to the three and a half to 12 million, it's considerably less. But I think uh, on whole, on balance, and everybody that I've talked to and everyone I know about it, I think financially, the difference between uh, going on your own uh, versus having a, a financial partner it's a jump ball financially. I think both approaches work just fine. Both can fail. Uh, maybe you can do even a little better with a financial partner. I don't think that's the issue. I think more, it's, it's more of a lifestyle issue. If you have a, a financial partner, what's going to happen is there, the horizon, the financial partner's horizon is going to be either relatively short term, three, four, five years, possibly midterm five to seven years, and I don't think any of us see them longer than 10 years. Uh, and you, when you sign up for it, you say, that's great, I'm happy with, with a 10-year deal. But things can change. Here's a real-world example. Pension fund is your financial partner. Pension funds, I think you all know, have uh, allocations in equities or stock, bonds, real estate, um, hedge funds, and alternative investments. If the stock market collapses, as it does every once in a while, suddenly, overnight, the hedge fund is, in it, its terms, overweighted in real estate. So your deal, you can be two years into a five-year project, you can have 80% of the deal done, but still not be complete and still be at a very vulnerable point when the pension fund says, we're really sorry, and, and they're nice about it, we're, <laughs> we're really sorry, but we need to sell today or you need to buy us out, and you say, but wait, 
I've got two years of my life in this deal, and we're going to make nothing. And the pension fund says, you know, sorry, deal's a deal. That can happen. The, the other thing that can happen, um, take my $10 million deal, say it's an office building, and say that you lease it to, uh, you get lucky, it's happening in Silicon Valley, you lease the whole thing to Facebook for an incredible amount of money, and you go to your, your partner, and now it's a, uh, uh, some publicly traded financial company, and you say, guys, we're in it for 10, we can sell it for 20, let's sell, the market's never gonna be hotter. And they say, no, you know, we don't wanna do that. You know, Sorry, John, we don't wanna do that because that'll cause a spike in our earnings. And, and the analysts and our stockholders don't like spikes in earnings. They like to see kind of a reverse bunny slope, you know, just kind of a nice gradual increase in earnings. So we're not gonna sell. You sit there and grind your teeth and say, oh my God, we're gonna miss this market, and sure enough, you do. And you know, in fairness to financial partners, and this, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny here, I, I'm <laughs> not too hard anyway. In fairness to financial partners, you can have the world's best, most reasonable, empathetic, kind. Mother Teresa can be your financial partner. You know, she can be absolutely wonderful, and you can be the cause of the problem. Your wife can dump you, your husband can leave you, another project that she's not involved in can go bankrupt, and two years into a 10-year hold deal, you need to sell, and you say, mother, uh, can we please sell this project or you buy me out? And then she kind of goes, no. <laughs> you know, she says a deal's a deal, you know, we're, we're staying in. So my point is that uh, a long-term financial partner can take what's already, we all know this, a fairly illiquid asset or let's face it, a highly illiquid asset and make it that much more illiquid. So our approach, what happened to us? Again, as I told you, we started uh, more than 30 years ago, no money, um, and we started with friends doing limited partnership deals. In fact, we still have our first big shopping center that we did with limited partners, uh, and it's 33, 34 years old. But we soon enough, we were lucky um, in lots of ways. One way we were, we were lucky was this was the early 80s and this was uh, the SNL time. So we quickly enough graduated from doing uh, family and friends money to institutional joint ventures. And I think we probably did, we had three or four partners and we did more than a half a dozen deals. And some of the partners were absolutely great. Uh, just one, I became a very close personal friend. Some were okay, and one, uh, a Texan, he was just an absolute scorpion. <laughs> the kind of guy that, that hides behind the partnership agreement, just kind of waiting for you to make a mistake so he can pounce and, you know. Uh, but what happened was, and it didn't matter whether the partner was good, bad, or indifferent, what happened was they did invariably what was best for them, not for the partnership, but what was best for their company. Absolutely understandable. Same thing that any of us in this room would do if we were the financial partner. The problem you know, for us is that usually when your financial partners, remember I told you that the limited partnerships are, are non-recourse. So you do everything you're supposed to do. You go out and you get the tenants, you get the zoning, you're, you're all, you get the building permit, you're all set, set to go. And the partnership agreement says at this point, financial partner will fund $5 million. So you go to financial partner and say, okay, please fund, and they say, here are the keys. Oops. And uh, you look at the, that agreement the other way and say, gosh, it's non-recourse, there's nothing we can do. That happened to us. Uh, and that happens almost always at the most inopportune time. That happens when there is no other financial partner out there to take them out, because you know they, they tend, like the rest of us, to move in a herd. So the, the herd is coming in, everybody's happy with real estate, or they're, they're galloping off the planes. So after that happened to us a few times, we decided, uh, you know, the epiphany on the, on the road to Tarsus uh, in the early 90s was that we'd rather not have financial partners. So we shifted from doing kind of larger scale joint ventures to deals a tenth the size, little deals, uh, not glamorous at all, but that we owned 100% of. Um, and over the last, so 25 years, we've averaged a couple deals a year doing that. We've sold, I'd say, two out of three. That it gave us the capital. And, and when we could, of course, we'd trade, but that 
trading didn't always work. When we, um, so we take the capital and move on to our next deal. And what we found, I'd say to our, our pleasant, mild surprise, that as far as we could tell, the, the net return to us uh, on these small deals where we owned 100% of it was just as great as you know, talking to our friends who, who, were, who went the, the big JV partner rate as those in the big joint ventures, and maybe with a, a few less headaches. I don't think anyone controls his or her own destiny, but I think if you don't have financial partners, it makes it a little easier. I was talking to somebody last night at, at, at a dinner, who um, younger guy who has the financial partners, and he says the problem is, as a young developer, you can create a uh, transgenerational asset. It, you know, maybe four or five of the things that, that, that you put together are crap, but maybe one of them is, I don't know, on the beach in Malibu. There's some place that's absolutely irreplaceable, and you know that it's going to be a great asset, you know, like the pyramids of Egypt in 3,000 years. But because you have a financial partner with that five-year horizon, you're going to have to sell it. So you're going to create this brilliant asset, and you know has to be sold. That's one thing that we don't have to do. OK, th those of you who are actually looking at the slides, notice I had stuck uh, a reference to the NTM earlier on. And just kind of wrapping up you know, the, the prepared remarks here, you know, what is the NTM? Uh, it's not a formula. It's a question. Uh, it's a question I think you might consider asking yourself any time you're going to do a, a, a partnership, buy a piece of property, or perhaps take a job. What is it? It's this. What is the net to me? <laughs> You know, people lose sight of that. What you really want to do before you get into a deal is, what am I going to get out of it? And it's not a selfish thing. It's just an analysis. Let's go back to my example and say that developer uh, elects to go the financial partner out, and she's going to do the 10 deals. And she's got one or two going, but realizes she needs a partner. So she comes to you and says, do this deal with me. Uh, I'll pay you 150,000 a year in salary, and I'll give you 25% of the profits. And you say, okay, cool. Uh, how much are the profits? And she says, well, look, they average $3 million. And so, you know, we can all do simple math. You say 750,000, whoa, that's pretty cool. And she says, maybe I'll give you another one. And you say a million five, that sounds pretty cool. But if you're thinking about the NTM and you're a little bit more diligent, and you remember this, that most uh, larger developers, they have an outside financial partner and they tend to have an inside financial partner. The inside financial partner is someone who typically gets half the deal for putting up all of the, the extreme at-risk money. That is the good faith deposits to the seller, uh, the A&E uh, that you need to, to put up, the, the, the fees, the, the, the money that goes at risk before the deal is fully entitled. So you've got that inside partner taking 50%. And then once the deal is all set, you know, and, and the ribbons are tied around it, and it's ready to start construction, that's when you bring in the outside partner for 65%. So doing the NTM calculation, you take that 3 million, and somebody here said anybody can beat me to this. But you take 3 million and take away 65%, then take the remainder uh, of that, take away 50%, and then solve for your 25%, and you come up with, any, anybody, I can't see, it's about $130,000. So it's a fair amount of money, but way less than you might have told yourself. And guys, it, I'm only talking about this because I have heard time and time again here at ULI over the years, people saying, yeah, the deal worked out. It actually worked out the way I thought, but I got a whole lot less money than I thought. And it, but had they really thought about it in the beginning, you could kind of see exactly you know, where the profit was going to be. The other part about the NTM, remember Einstein is famous for a lot of things. One of the things he's famous for is time. You know, before, it, it was just to be th three dimensions. Now there are four, time being the fourth dimension. What all any of us have in, in this world is time. Take that 131,000 I just used. Say it's a cashier's check. Say Bill Gates is sitting here in the front row for, for some unknown reason. <laughs> Just say. Uh, and then say you say, you know, hey, Bill, there's a cashier's check for 131000 back there. 
I'm guessing, I don't know the guy, but I am guessing he would say, what the hell? He'd get up, walk back, and take the pick up the 131,000. Why? His hourly rate is infinite. I know the rest of us, there'd be a stampede <laughs> if we said there's, there's a cashier's check for 100. We'd all run for that. Infinite return. If on the other hand, back to that same example, the, the developer told the truth to the, the, the young would-be partner and said, look, I'll give you the whole 750,000, but this is not an easy uh, rezone. This is in Santa Monica, this is in Berkeley, this is in San Francisco. It's gonna take 12 or 15 years of community meetings, of architectural meetings, and planning, and city council meetings. And if you don't actually make the minimum wage on that 750,000, you actually, you're gonna feel like you did you know, after your 30th night up to midnight dealing with neighbors who'd rather spit roast you, you know, than, than approve your project. It's time. You really have to ask yourself, how much time is this deal going to take? And just to kind of underscore that, I remember I, I was present when a, a homeowner asked a, a wily contractor, well, how long is this remodel going to take? You know, what should I expect? And the, he said, lady, it's going to cost twice as much as you originally think and take three times as long. Now, that was a little cynical, but that, that's actually not so far off the mark. So it's going to take a long time. I would think about in the net to be calculation, figuring out your hourly rate. Now I'm gonna turn it over to questions. Before I do, I'd just like to point out the obvious. Everybody in this room is far more fortunate than 99% of the people on the planet. We've all been dealt a wonderful uh, hand in, in, in the poker game of life. The way to thank God or Darwin or whoever it is you talk to in the dark is to give back, and not just your, uh, your money, but your time. Um, I'm open for questions, happy to answer anything. The question was, when we left the, the big financial partner world into doing deals on our own, how did we, hands, uh, how did we deal with having to sign personally? Uh, we signed personally, is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, I, you know, I, I, I am, uh, I guess, I'm almost an apostate on this issue. You'll hear guys who, smarter than I am and, and, and far wealthier tell you that they never sign guarantees and you should never ever do that. That's good advice, but yeah, particularly if you're starting out, that's almost impossible to follow. We tended, to, we solved that actually. You know that example I used, $10 million with $4 million down. I suggest if you're gonna put $4 million of your own money down, you're gonna be really careful in that deal. So you're gonna say to yourself, hell, I've got $4 million up, What's the worst that can happen? I'll lose that and a little bit more. So, but that said, we don't build spec. Uh, the, the retail, uh, the, the state of retail is, is an entirely different conversation, but the, the charm in retail historically was you'd have your supermarket or your drugstore or your McDonald's in tow. So you might be 60, 70, 80% pre-leased. So we would sign guarantees, but not on spec buildings. So the question was, in, in my example, it was very simple. It was just equity and, and a first of 65%. The question was, in our deals, uh, do we stick in a mez or mezzanine piece, which essentially is a second, if you will, with, uh, are participating in order to jazz up our return? And our, the answer is no. <laughs> we, we don't do that. But we're, we're pretty cautious. We try to, to keep our leverage as low as possible. But that is... You know, leverage is a beautiful thing in an up market. Uh, it, it's a way to, uh, you know, get a 10x return, and of course, it's a way to, to get killed in a down market. So, uh, we're we're kind of cautious. So we we've never done a mez piece. The question is, what's the difference between friends and family money, or country club money, it's sometimes called, and uh, institutional money? Institutional money is often known as hot money, and there's a reason because it's going to burn a hole in your pocket and then you know, right into Institutional money has a much higher rate of return to it. Institutional money tends to have total control of the project. You've got one partner, which is great, even when you sell it once. So on the front end, it's a lot easier. But they control it. And you tend to have to, if with institutional money, if you hit your marks absolutely perfectly, it, uh, you're in and out in 24 months, you tend to actually make more money than you might have with the limiteds, but if you miss a year, or if you miss two years, 
the, the snowball on the cumulative preferred return for institutional money will eat you alive. I think anybody who's done a, a financial partner JV has done uh, deals that end up being okay deals where the, inst the institutional partner has a 10% preferred return, let's say, uh, and the deal works out to be a 9% return. So what happens is this, the snowball just gets bigger and bigger. Uh, we've done that. Back to that point about the uh, hard to find 10 deals that, that make sense, or, or excuse me, that make that kind of return. I was thinking about it. I would guess a top flight developer in 10 deals might get that kind of return, that 3 million or 30% return, and five or six deals. Uh, he might, because of the, the, the joint venture and the cost of the money, he might break even or make a little bit of money on two or three or four deals. He might lose money on one deal. The other side of the coin, the, the family and friends, the problem is you've got to raise it in small chunks. You know, if you raise a million dollars at, at, at 25000 a pop, that's 40 times you've got to sell the same story. You're like a a bad actor in an off-Broadway play, you're just repeating the lines over, this is a great deal, please invest with me. It's, it's, it's very hard, but the, the return uh, that they expect is much lower, you know, it's a five or six percent return, and they usually tend to be long-term. That first deal that we did in 1982, they're limited partners, they're still in the deal, I can't get rid of them. You know, uh, and, and, and they're delighted, you know, it, it, it's got a high return to it. And the other thing is, once you close a limited partnership, it's harder in the beginning because you're selling it 40 times, but once you close it as a, the general, you have much more control. You don't have a single 800-pound gorilla who can say, sell tomorrow or refinance tomorrow. You've got this disparate group of uh, limiteds that don't know one another, so you have much better control. The question was, have I compared the, the, the VC approach to the real estate approach? We're in Palo Alto. Uh, we, we, are, we actually own the building that Axel Partners, uh, which is the number one VC firm in the world. We're their landlord. Uh, would they say hello to us on the street? No. Do they know who we are? No. <laughs> but we know who they are. I think most of you know that the VC deal is uh, that they charge 2% and they get uh, no matter win, lose, or fail every year of all the money they raise, plus 20% of the profits. The VC model is almost the mirror image of the real estate model. I think they anticipate, just take what I just said, they anticipate outright losing money on five, six, seven deals, making a little bit of money or breaking even on two or three, and then getting that 10x or 100x return on Facebook or Google on that one deal. It's just the reverse of ours. So our, our worlds don't meet. Uh, somebody was asking me, uh, a, a, a journalist in Silicon Valley, uh, about Rich. Oh, I, I asked her, she said, I said, well, well, what's Rich? And she said, well, are you talking real estate rich or tech rich? And I said, oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, totally different story. Uh, the question was, when, when we did have joint venture partners, uh, did the uh, institutional partner guarantee the debt? The answer is no, they, they did not. Uh, but they had, we had enough equity up, and then we had to do that, the guarantee for the construction loans in those days. And you as the general Yes, we as the generals were, were doing those guarantees, and I think those were more than completion guarantees at that time. Uh, but we also, we had, a, a, let's say, back to that 60-40 model, we had a relative level of comfort that we could finish the project for that. So yes, there was a guarantee, but uh, no, I didn't think it was uh, that big a deal. The question was, did, where we were doing the guarantee, did, did we charge a separate fee? No. Yeah, typically, I, it, and again, we don't do these kind of arrangements anymore, but I think typically you get maybe a small acquisition fee and maybe two or three percent uh, of the hard construction cost. And then the, with institutional partners, they, they make it very complicated. You know, we get 80-20 80, 80, for the first so, so much, and then 70-30, 60-40, 50. But it ends up, I think if you add it all, close to that 65-35 split that I used in my example. The question was, could I tell you about retail? It's a, um, sure, and this, this is, it's a great segue to going out and getting drunk, I think. <laughs> uh, re retail, it, I'm not, I, uh, what did Mad back to World Series, what did Madison Bumgarner say a few years ago? So I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> uh, re retail's in some hurt. Uh, it, I don't think, I think it's largely, 
the, the factoid that I keep reading is that we have 50 square feet of retail space for every man, woman, and child in the country, 50 square feet. Europe, on the other hand, has two or three. So we just have this enormous oversupply of retail space on the one hand. It, and if Amazon didn't exist, if e-commerce didn't exist, we'd still have a problem. And, and one of the, the problems is every new retailer comes out and says, well, I don't want that empty box. You know, I, I need my own special prototypical box. So the, the building just goes on and on. Uh, when you add into that oversupply the fact that e-commerce, while e interestingly, e-commerce isn't making any money, it's sure causing everybody else to lose money. So Amazon is, is I think, is on its way to becoming the world's biggest bricks and mortar retailer. Uh, and Amazon and, and Walmart are going to meet in the middle. But I don't think a week goes by now where we don't see some still, uh, let's call it, at least reasonably vibrant retailer telling us they're right-sizing. Last one I saw was Kohl's. I think you all know Kohl's. It's a discount department store. 100,000 square feet. Well, Kohl's just came out in the last week or two with an announcement saying our right size is 80,000 feet. Uh, so that means, dear landlord, that we're going to have a 20,000 foot vacancy in your shopping center. Yes, we're going to be paying the rent on it, but it's going to be kind of a blight in your center. And any time a big tenant, an anchor tenant, has, is paying rent on empty space, it's a problem. So, and why is that happening? It, and we all experience this. I just went into the North Face. I like their stuff, and I said, there's a, like a shirt you know, uh, that I wear. And sure enough, they didn't have it in my size. And they said, and they have very limited stock in size, but they said, here, give me your credit card. I'll buy it for you online right now from our warehouse, and you'll have it tomorrow or the next day. The store got the credit for it, so that the store, rather than having 100 shirts my size, they've got 10. Uh, and so. The retailers, even the best retailers, are shrinking. Uh, the worst retailers, and uh, there's Sears, Kmart, Penny, you know, they're they're all going to be gone. Uh, you this you may not have heard it here first, but I'm telling you that Amazon, you know, a Amazon bought Whole Foods. Not, you know, Amazon has like one percent of the food market. Whole Foods had about one percent of the food market. If Amazon weren't in the in the headline, it wouldn't have been a story. But Amazon bought that not for food, but as a distribution channel. Uh, the, the Amazon customer and the Whole Foods customer, they're identical, you know, high end, uh, very tech savvy. Amazon is going to buy for pennies on the dollar, I'm guessing, uh, Sears or Pennies or Kmart or one of these guys, and suddenly they'll have a nationwide distribution system of, of boxes. So that no one has solved the cost of the last mile. You know, Amazon, frankly, loses money on e-commerce. They say they can make money when they change their business model, but I'm not so sure. So Amazon, sooner or later, is going to come around to saying, OK, here's our distribution center. You drive the last mile, just like you're going to Costco. You come pick up the toilet paper or the books or whatever it is. That's my take on retail. It's a, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody jumping into the retail business right now. The uh, question was, uh, given what I know now about development, should, should I have picked another career? Now nah, it, it's worked out pretty well for us. Uh, it's fun. I, I love doing deals. It, it's like a, uh, a three-dimensional New York Times crossword puzzle. It's, sometimes it's challenging, but uh, no, I, I think it's a lot of fun. I, I highly recommend it. That's why I'm here, talking to you guys. The question was, what, why do developers want to develop on, on, on the coastal flats, where we absolutely know that, that uh, the, the waters are rising? And every time, so you know, I, I live in Northern California, the Russian River, it floods every other year. And every other year, the same people are standing out in front of their flooded house saying, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. Well, dude, how about just building your house 10 feet higher? <laughs> you know. What are we talking about here? It's the same thing. I, I, I think it's, it's a shame. You know, that there's, there are so many things that you can kind of rail or rally against, but the fact that we use public money to buy insurance for, for uh, private uh, landowners on beaches where we know they're going to flood, we should give them, you get one bite at this apple, and if it floods once, here's the money, but we're, no more, no more insurance. I, I, I totally agree, it's crazy. Um, the question was, uh, knowing what I know today, <laughs> if I started again in 1982, uh, would I do things differently? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, it, th 
I'll be honest, things have worked out pretty well, so I, I, I would not want to tempt fate and say I'd like to start over. I, I, I'm pretty content, so I, I guess, no. I, we made it. You have to make the mistakes along the way, I think, in order to, to get there. You, you can't just, you could read my book, but you're still going to make the mistakes. You know, uh, you just, some things, the only way to know what fire feels like is to stick your finger in it. Question was, what do I think about crowdfunding? Uh, I've been agnostic about crowdfunding. Um, there, there are two basic kinds of crowdfunding. One is a pure platform where just putting investors in touch with developers. You know, so the, and the crowdfunder uses the software, and so I, as a developer, put my project up, and then uh, I attract investors that way. And that actually seems to me like it, it should work, and, and that's the, the crowd street approach. Then the other approach is uh, Realty Mogul, I think it's called, where the crowdfunder acts as the general partner. You know, what I think it, the problem with, with crowdfunding thus far, but that they'll solve this gradually, is they don't have the experience, the guys who run these. Uh, it, it takes, I don't know, five, 10 years to get good at, at underwriting real estate, uh, to get good at underwriting loans. So to expect 20-somethings um, who are, are very adroit technically, uh, in it to do in with the software, to expect them to be able to underwrite these projects, uh, I think is asking too much. I, I think the pure platform is, will work, but the point I raised at, the, at this lunch today, just coincidentally, was the best developers already have their financial partners, uh, or they do it without financial partners. So who is going to be attracted to the crowdfunding? It, it's either new young developers who don't have a track record and who can't attract capital any other way, and uh, developers with spotty records. So I think the hardest part is getting the quality developers to uh, adopt the platform. I think it'll come. Uh, they said there's a, Jared Kushner has a, a big crowdfunding platform. What's it called? Cadre. Yeah, I just heard this, this is breaking news to me. So Jared Kushner, thanks, Dad, has a <laughs> has a crowdfunding platform that was called Cadre. George Soros is backing it, uh, and it's already valued at eight hundred and fifty million dollars. And and it's a, a pure platform, but kind of high end. So seeking the you know the family investment funds and everybody else to, so you, to try to. So a developer you know, such as ourselves would try to get a million dollars here, five million dollars there. So I, I think it's going to work ultimately, but I, I'm not sure it's there yet. And I, and I still worry about the quality of the sponsorship. So the question was at the, Am <laughs> the, the Amazon sweet states, uh, where are they going to go and should a city bend over for Amazon? I'll answer that in reverse. I don't think any city should bend over at all. I, 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 that just drives me crazy. Uh, when, we shouldn't be giving money to, to public stadiums or ballparks, and we should not be giving money to, uh, to, to tech companies that are putting mom and pop businesses out of work. Absolutely, I, that just drives me crazy. I, I think the other thing is that the city that will win, and I don't know who it is, doesn't need to give them anything, because Amazon has to go where smart kids are, smart tech kids. It, it cannot, if, if Winnemucca, Nevada says, We'll give you a jillion dollars. Amazon still wouldn't do it because there's no talent there. You know, so <laughs> you know, the winner already won and, and should just say, "Screw you, Amazon." You know, you know, it's all right if you love to Tom Petty, rest in peace. It's all right if you love me. It's all right if you don't. Okay. Um, the question was, when we tie up a deal, um, do we put in a promote? Do um, I'll, I'll I'll try to say it a different way. We don't have outside partners anymore. We just use our own capital. So if, as, as a result of that, we don't have any preferred returns. We don't have any promotes. It's just money in, money out. Life's pretty simple. That said, you know, we're, we're now, if you're a successful developer, ultimately, you know, you age out. You, you can only go to planning commission meetings so long. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's true. Uh, and so now we're, we're funding younger guys, and, and there are promotes in there. But, and, and again, it's the typical country club deal where there's a, a small fee to uh, the developer on acquisition and then a two to three percent um, hard cost uh, 
piece, and then whatever, maybe a five or six percent preferred return, maybe it's seven, and then say a 50-50 split. I mean, that's, that's the classic country club deal. Uh, and so now we're on the money side of that, and that, that's kind of you know, where, where they end up. Yeah, the question was, am I concerned about the cost of housing in Palo Alto, West LA, and everywhere? And the answer is yes. In Palo Alto, the, the median home price is 2.2 million. That is insane. So basically, everybody has been priced. If, if you don't inherit the house, or if you're not a tech guru, you're not buying a house in Palo Alto anymore. I mean, two doctors, two lawyers, you still need to save the $500,000 for the down payment. And then I think you need about 300, I, I did this math once, to, to qualify for a million six loan you know, on that 2.2, you put down 600,000, you need about 350,000 in income. So very few people have that. Yeah, and the answer is simple, uh, it's density. You know, and it, you know, I, I hate going to all these conferences where, where people kind of dance around it, or, you know, or we all recognize, yeah, the cities have to, to increase density, but they're not so far. Um, it's something that the, I think needs to be mandated by the state to vastly increase density. Towns like Palo Alto have just raised the drawbridge, or Brentwood down here, I imagine, Hillsborough and Atherton in Northern California, all over. The question is, have, have we followed the evolution of, of financial capital and, and financial institutional money? And the answer is no. Yeah, it, once we got out of it, you know, we, we were kind of content in our little world. So it, I kind of look over my shoulder and see what guys are doing. I do understand that there are institutions now, for example, that are doing longer term hold deals. And, and that point where, you know, you create this brilliant asset and your financial partner says, well, gee, sorry, you know, you knew you knew, you, you knew we were a stake. Yeah. When, you, when you, we did the deal, you knew it was a seven-year-old. We got to sell. But I understand there are partners out there that will do longer holds. But it's not something that we've really investigated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.